if you're in the market for a shiny new electric car, here's 10 things you'd best wrap your brain around before heading out on that all-important test drive. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. I think a lot of people approach the concept of EV ownership from two basic standpoints. Number one is they want to do the right thing or what they perceive to be as the right thing in relation to the future and the environment. And it's hard to have a shot at people for trying that on. And number two, of course, is divorcing oneself from big oil and dependency on liquid hydrocarbons and all of the sort of negative implications or the perceived negative implications of all of that. And that's kind of fair enough too. But if you're stalled on the grid at one of those two points, you've got to get from there to actually making friends with owning and living with an EV. And if you go to the dealership without jumping through these 10 hoops, then I'd suggest that you are doing yourself a disservice. Now, happily enough, no special adaptation by you is going to be required because there are only minor driving operational type differences. Most obviously, there's four push buttons here in place of the conventional transmission shifter, park, reverse, neutral, and drive. And let's face it, in time, even the chief executive officer of a major television network in Australia could learn to understand that with the right remedial instruction. There's also, you know, a standard start stop button, only in this case it says power. And when you hit that, have a listen. Just a few dings to tell me I'm not wearing the seatbelt and a chime and then the dash lights up and that's it. And that could be a little bit of a problem for you the first time around because most of us have this differential diagnosis for is the engine running and am I good to go? And the differential diagnosis that's been dialed in up here for years or decades of driving in my case is is the car shaking like this because of all the rotating, burning, reciprocating, whatever going on up there. When you jump in an EV, you get deafening silence, little bit of air conditioning, lights on the dash, and that's it. And the first time you do this, guaranteed, you will double check yourself and you'll go, is there something else? <laughs> Am I good to go? And happily enough, no, there's nothing else. You are good to go. You essentially only have to decide backwards or forwards and then just drive normally. The next thing to realize is there's no gear changing because, hey, there's no gears. One of the things to realize about the difference between electric motors and internal combustion engines is that electric motors run just fine at very low RPMs. Internal combustion engines don't, right? Internal combustion engines have a great deal of difficulty functioning at all, even at idle with no load at say five or 600 RPM. That's kind of the absolute limit of their happiness. And when you think about it, that's still pretty fast because 600 RPM is 10 revolutions per second. An electric motor is happy running at bugger all. In fact, they deliver immense torque at low speeds, and that means they really don't need a gearbox. A gearbox in an internal combustion engine car is really just an apologist for the engine not being able to function very well at low RPMs, and that's why you need all those lower gears. By the time you're in fourth gear or fifth gear or something in a modern gearbox, you're essentially running at one to one between the gearbox input shaft and the gearbox output shaft. So. The internal combustion engine is very happy running at those 
30, 40, 50, 60, 70 mile an hour speeds, that's fine. The gearbox is there to make it function at low speeds. And in an EV, you don't need any of that. So it's kind of a silent, smooth, seamless transmission experience. But you will not need to worry about any of that because there is no gear changing to be done. There's no automatic gearbox, there's no CVT, there's no direct shift gearbox, and there is certainly no manual. These things regeneratively break, and this is kind of the braking energy management voodoo that leapt to the fore when they released the first hybrids. See, when you're driving a conventional car and you take your foot off the gas because the traffic slows down in front or because you're going downhill and you don't need any further propulsion because gravity's doing the work, well, in all of these cases, the wheels are just sort of freewheeling, the engine's not doing much, and then at some point you need to jam your foot on the brakes if only to stop the car running away downhill or to stop for a traffic light or because the cars in front of you are stopping. And when you hit the brakes in a conventional car, the pads grab the discs and they generate heat. They convert the car's kinetic energy into heat, which is bled into the air by convection and that is energy that you lose and you can never regain it. It's just dissipated in ambient air. The cool voodoo with energy management that hybrids and EVs pull off is this. When you take your foot off the accelerator and the wheels start sort of freewheeling, what they're really doing in that case is they're driving the electric motor that is connected to the drive system. So instead of the electric motor taking energy from the battery and sort of burning it, if you like, and turning the wheels, giving you propulsion, the system gets driven the other way. The wheels drive the electric motor, effectively turning it into a generator and pumping electricity back into the battery. The cool energy management voodoo, which is a really clever trick when you think about it. So when you're going downhill, you take your foot off the accelerator, the engine, if you like, the electric motor, turns into a generator and pumps up the battery. The same thing if you lift off the accelerator when you notice the traffic stopping down there. Regenerative braking absolutely rocks. But when you think about point number two and point number three together, this would be the energy management voodoo coupled with no transmission, there's an obvious problem when you look over here. You may be taken somewhat aback when you sit in the Ionic for the first time and you look down there, as it were, and you discover what appear to be shifting paddles, gear shifting paddles. And you may say, what spawn of the devil trickery is this? Shifting paddles here, apparently, and shifting paddles there, apparently too, one for each hand. Why is it so? Well, it's not exactly to change gear, but it is to adjust the aggressivity of the regenerative braking. The one on the left hand is to increase the regenerative braking, and the one on the right hand decreases the regenerative braking. So let's say you're going down a big steep hill and the car starts to get faster and faster, and instead of putting your foot on the brake, you can just give the left hand bit of a nudge, couple of nudges perhaps, and you will notice, and it will feel just like downshifting with the paddles in an ordinary car, you will notice more retardation as greater regenerative braking capability is brought to bear. And once you've had enough of that, let's say the slope tapers off a little bit, you just give the other hand a bit of a nudge and you can adjust it quite seamlessly, but you will notice a difference in the amount of freewheeling, running away type sensation that you feel. And if you get good at this, you can turn this into a, like a, an EV driver's technical challenge because every time you lunch off the more aggressive regenerative braking, you are tipping more electrons. Well, not just back there, they're kind of down there where the battery is. But anyway, you are recharging the battery more, meaning you're getting more of a free ride out of your EV and you're getting more range out of it too. And this can be something that keeps you occupied in traffic apart from anything else. It's a really neat trick. And one of the side benefits of this entire process, should you lunch off the 
somewhat more aggressive regenerative braking from time to time is even less brake wear because every time you're regeneratively braking, you're not braking so much using the friction and that's going to reduce your service costs over time as well. What are we up to now? Like tip number five or something? Numeracy. So overrated. Anyway, let's call it five. These things are silent. It's deafening silence. And this can sort of be a good bad news thing. To me, when you first drive an EV, it's kind of like going to the movies where they play a really special movie of the final cut with all the dialogue and all the vision, all the special effects, the Technicolor, whatever but none of the other sound effects. It's like no footsteps, no doors opening and closing, no waves crashing on the beach. And that's a little bit disconcerting. And it's kind of a good thing if you're really into that refinement, but it could be a bad thing as well because you've got some benchmarks in your head about the way you perceive, for example, how fast the car is going, how fast you're driving it at this point. And part of that benchmark is acoustic, right? You're used to the amount of noise your car makes at 60 k's an hour. When you're driving an EV, you don't get that noise. So you can say, ah, oh, yeah, this feels like about 60. And in actual fact, <laughs> you're doing 85 or 90, which is license goes on holiday territory. At least it is here in Schittsville. So my strong advice to you would be, to pay attention to the speedo because you can be getting mixed messages from your eardrums and if you make the wrong decision you could end up trying to explain all of this to quite an unreceptive police officer on the side of the road who thinks he's heard it all but this is the latest brand new excuse for him. And there's one final flip side. Let's call it point number six. The flip side of this acoustic attenuation. You're not gonna get any of the vibration, any of the reciprocation of the pistons, none of the transmission whining and all of that stuff that just occurs in the background every other time you've driven a car. That's all like just not there. It's suddenly been cut out like a cancer. But what you will notice as a result is that the wind noise and the road noise is subjectively louder. And you might get in an EV and go, gee, those mirrors are making a bit of noise, or gee, that road's noisy when I drive on those, you know, ripple strips and other sort of acoustic markers that they put in to let you know you're drifting left and right, or just joins in the road, you know, where the concrete's been covered over with bitumen and the joins move and all of a sudden you get that thump thump thing. That can seem a lot louder. And that is entirely you playing tricks on yourself because I don't know if you've ever been in one of those magic chambers that eliminates all sort of ambient noise. What do they call them? Anechoic chambers or something. I was, I've been in one once and after about five minutes, it is completely nauseating because you start hearing all of the noises that you make. You start hearing lunch being digested and how noisy your breathing actually is. And I guess this is like the flip side of making an environment really quiet is that every noise, no matter how minor, becomes subjectively much louder. So if you notice the wind and the road noise and you think, oh, I'm not sure about this, it's your brain playing tricks on your perception with acoustics. If you're in the market for an EV, you're thinking about recharging, right? You can recharge from dead flat in about 12 hours from a standard Australian wall outlet, or you can cop an 80% fast charge in under half an hour from one of these babies. Hopefully they'll proliferate in car parks and every 160 k's or so on major highways in time. But let's not be harbouring any fantasies about installing one of these units at home because 50 kilowatts is kind of commercial. You'll be at war with the neighbours because it's not so much fun for them when the lifts all stop working because some well-heeled greenie needs a fast fix of electrons. Thankfully, 
there's a middle ground solution. So if you are gonna amp up at home, it's much more likely you'll do it with one of these babies. You get the same basic plug, but three times as much electricity comes out of this box compared with a standard wall outlet. So here in Shaya, it's 240 volts and 10 amps for a basic wall outlet. And this baby is about three times that, so it's seven and a bit kVA, I'd suggest. And what that basically means is it's going to cut your recharging time to about a third. So if it takes 12 hours to charge up with a standard wall outlet from dead flat, it's gonna take about four hours to charge up in the same condition with one of these. My only thing about that is you'd have to ask yourself, do you really need that? two grand to install one of these things. That's a basic installation, provided they don't have to move heaven and earth to get the power where you need it, or, you know, cut up a big concrete slab or something. So if you're only gonna drive 50 or 60 kilometers in a day and come home, you're only gonna be using 25% of the battery's total charge capacity. And that means a standard wall outlet is gonna get you going again, back to fully charged in about three hours. So unless you plan on coming home with a very depleted battery often, with a short turnaround time between now and getting going again, you probably don't even need one of these. Okay, so hopefully that's gonna save you a few bucks. You might not need that big fat charging station at all. Now, I don't know if you can hear that right now, but just have a listen. It's kind of raining, we're just having a cloud burst fortuitously enough to make this next point. Now, not everybody has the perfect garage waterproof recharging environment. Certainly I don't, after I turned my beautiful double garage into a fat cave for YouTube video production. Now anyway, cars are out here, there's a waterproof sale upstairs and this is kind of waterproof now but if it really honks down, everything's getting drenched, okay? What if you go to sleep like that and you're plugged in with a cord running out here inconveniently enough? What if you hear the pitter patter of rain up there and you emerge from <laughs> sleep a bit groggy and you run down here, you've got wet feet and maybe you've got wet hands as well from, I don't know, nudging something out of the way. When you do that, your external skin resistance is like trashed that's kind of bad for what's coming up. What if you pick this up and you part the connection and all of a sudden you form, worst case scenario, an effective conduction path to earth? If you do that, that's the same as opening, for the, opening the window for the Grim Reaper and inviting him to chalk you up, okay? So at the very least, if you have one of these imperfect environments for recharging, make sure that your circuit that you are using, the wall outlet that you are using, is protected by a core balance relay, which is, we call them safety switches in Australia. I don't know what you call them in your neck of the woods. They're often called RCDs, residual current devices, or ELCBs for earth leakage circuit breakers. Whatever you call them, make sure you've got one. If there's anything iffy about the location, of this joint in the recharging process because it's fine to save the planet but I'd suggest it's an imperfect result for you if you take yourself out of the picture by doing so. what are we up to, point number nine or something, whatever. You wouldn't be normal if you did not want to know what this car was packing down there. And isn't it fascinating how they kind of went with the internal combustion aesthetic. So no, you don't get additional luggage space up the pointy end, quite the opposite. It's exactly the same as an internal combustion car from a packaging point of view. But I'd have to say there is a lot more space around here. So there's that. Everything under here color coded orange presumably means electricity and everything colored black means, you know, all of the normal sort of plumbing stuff that you would see in a conventional car. <laughs> Thank you. 
if you have started equating EV with zero maintenance. Let's return to planet Earth. See that big coolant reservoir down there? That's a radiator, just like in a conventional car. It's there to stop the electrical inverter overheating. There's also conventional brakes, air conditioning, CV joints, bushes and dampers, power assistance on the steering and the brakes, and yet to be determined EV specific failure modes. So the service department at EV dealerships might operate slightly differently, but it is unlikely to be bored. And my best guess is you'll pay about half the servicing cost compared with a conventional car, and that's for the standard servicing items only, not including wear and tear. One of the most fascinating things of all though, and I need to get to the bottom of this is, conventional battery. How does that work? <laughs> if there was one thing this car was packing, I would have thought, you know, more than enough batteries elsewhere for getting the job done. So I will ask a technician about that and see if I can get a rational answer on why there is a conventional battery on this car at all. Why does it need that? Anyway, this is what's going on under the hood so that uh, you can have a sneak peek and you don't have to feel as if you've just asked a really ridiculous question to the sales guy at the dealership because that always puts you on the back foot. It's always harder to crunch him for a decent deal after you've just, you know, stuck your foot in it from a technical knowledge point of view. So there's that. just racing to beat this huge thunderstorm rolling in. Summer in Australia, yes! Where even the weather can kill you. Anyway, <laughs> when you live with a car for nearly 10 days, you're gonna learn a hell of a lot about it. I tried not to love Ionic and I tried not to hate it, but I ended up equivocating in this state of polar opposite dichotomy extremes of love and hate, because where it's good, it's actually very good, but where it's got deficiencies, it's kind of glaring. So there's that. But here's the thing, okay, and it happened to me this very morning because I had to get in my own car and take it for a short drive to my stig with a spanner for a service. This is the first time, okay, that I've driven an internal combustion car for 10 days. And here's the thing, there's no getting around it. It hit me in the face like a right hook from Iron Mike. When I started it up, I went, how noisy and unrefined is this? And it's like shaking like a double-decker bus full of epileptics. So maybe there is some merit to the battery-powered car caper after all. 